welcome to episode uh, 36 on the binomial theorem. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the expansion of binomials, powers of binomials, to rather large powers, and how we can compute them quickly. Let's go to our list of objectives for this episode. First of all, we're going to be looking at, uh, at patterns that we find in the expansion of binomials. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, if you were expanding like a plus b squared, a plus b cubed, a plus b to the fourth power, how we could uh, find patterns in the coefficients. And then we'll look at something that we call Pascal's triangle. This is named for a French mathematician named Blaise Pascal. Uh, then we'll move on to factorials and what we call binomial coefficients. And then finally, we'll look at a theorem that was first proved by Isaac Newton back in the around 1700, uh, just, just before 1700, called the binomial theorem. OK, well, let's begin by looking at uh, patterns in binomials and uh, the expansion of binomials. And let's go to the next graphic, and I think you'll see what we mean. OK, first of all, uh, we have a binomial, a plus b. And we're going to raise it to the 0 power. So um, what is a plus b to the 0 power? 1, one is 1. Okay, a so plus gonna, b isn't 0. Uh, if, that, that's exactly right. If a plus b is not 0, because 0 to the 0 power is undefined. That's a good point, Stephen. So uh, this answer is 1 otherwise. And uh, whoops, let's see. I must better go to a different marker for that. So, uh, so we get a 1 there. Yeah. So in all of these, I'll be assuming a plus b isn't, isn't 0. Uh, now, in the next case, a plus b to the first power is a plus b. So I'll write a plus b right here. You notice I'm kind of spreading it out. You'll see why in a moment. What is a plus b squared? a squared. OK, uh, a squared. Plus 2ab. Plus 2ab. Plus b squared. Plus b squared, yeah. And now, finally, a plus b cubed, that's not necessarily a formula people generally remember. Does anybody know what a plus b cubed is right offhand? a cubed. OK, a cubed. Plus 3a squared b. You're right, 3a squared b. Plus 3ab squared. 3ab squared, right, very good, plus b cubed. Plus b cubed. OK, now, what I want to do is look at some patterns that we see in these expansions of binomials. Uh, first of all, you notice that the number of terms, like here I have three terms, is one more than the exponent. If there's a square there, I get three terms. If there's a cube, I get four terms. It even worked up here. When there's a zero, I get one term, namely, namely one. So we always have one more term than we have for the power. Uh, the next thing we might notice is the powers on A go down by one. I have A cubed, A squared, A to the first power, and then essentially a to the 0, they're gone. a to the 0 is 1. At the same time the powers on a are going down, the powers on b are going up. I have b to the 0 here, or, or 1, b to the first power, b to the second, b to the third. So if the a's are going down and the b's are going up, what that means is I have the same number of variables in every term. So here I have a three times. Here I have two a's and a b, so that's a total of three. So this, this is referred to as a term of degree three. This is a term of degree three. I have an a and two b's. And this is a term of degree three. All the terms are of degree three. So if in the future, if you're expanding a, a binomial to some larger power, one of the things you want to notice is every term should be of that same degree as the initial, as the initial power, the cube right here. So what portion of this would be the really awkward part to find, then? The coefficients. It would be the coefficients, right. So what we need to do is turn our attention to the coefficients and see how we could find the coefficients. Like, in this case, the coefficients are 1, 3, 3, and 1. Uh, now, you know, the way we can find the coefficients, say, for, the, for this uh, a plus b cubed, is what if I go back up here to a plus b squared, and multiply it by a plus b, by a plus b. Now, uh, for example, to get the a cubed, I just multiply a squared times a, and that gives me a cubed. But I think there are several ways I can get terms that say a squared b. Uh, let's see, here's an a squared. If I multiply that times b, so if I multiply a squared times b, um, I'll come up with 1 a squared b. But what's another way I can come up with some a squared b's? 2ab times a. 
2AB times A, exactly right. I can multiply these two terms together and I'll get A squared B's. In that case, I'll get two of them. And so I get one, well, let me just put a one on top of that. I get one from this product and I get two from this product. Now, one plus two, that makes the total of three that we have right here. And you know, since I'm multiplying by one A and one B, the, the coefficients one and two are the same as the coefficients that I see right here, one A squared and two AB. So I'm thinking there's a pattern in this, and that is that if I add the two coefficients that I see right here, I'll get the coefficient that I need right below it. Uh, let's just try the three right here. If you look at the two coefficients right up above it, there's a two and a one. And if I add the two and the one, I get a three. And you might say, well, Dennis, what's the connection? So just because that's a two and a one, why should this be a three? Well, let's just uh, remove these arrows, and let's see if we can verify this pattern for this other term. Uh, here we have AB squares. Now, how can I get AB squares? Well, I can take a, the 2AB times B, and I'll get AB squared. I'll get two of them, which is exactly what that coefficient is. I get two of these. And I can also get some AB squares right here with this product, and I'll get one of those. And that's exactly the coefficient that's on the B squared. You see, this coefficient won't change because I'm just multiplying by 1A or by 1B, so that, that won't affect the coefficient. So if I take the 2 and the 1 and add them together, I'll get a 3 right here. That even works on the very ends, because the only way I can get an A cube is to take 1A squared times 1A, and that gives me A cube, or 1B and 1B squared gives me B cube. So the pattern is that if I add the two coefficients directly above, I'll get the coefficient on the term just below it. Now this leads us to what we call Pascal's triangle. And let's go to the next graphic and we'll, we'll see this. Uh, Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician who lived in the early 17th century. First half of the 17th century, obviously in France, I guess, Blaise Pascal. And uh, his triangle begins with a, with a one at the top and then two ones down below. And then, if I continue the ones down the diagonals, ones down the diagonals, the numbers in the middle are merely the sum of the two numbers directly above it. One and one is two. And the same thing here, one and two is three. And two and one is three. And on the next row, let's uh, we'll see, the ones are coming down on the ends. One and three is four. Three and three is six. Three and one is four. And this pattern continues, so actually there's really no end to Pascal's triangle. What would be the next row of the triangle? What number would go right here? One. One, okay, and then here? Five. Five, okay, and then? Ten. 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 Five. Five. One. And one. Now, with those numbers, we can now expand uh, a plus b to the fifth power. These are the coefficients of the terms. And uh, now I, I know it's the fifth power because if you look in the second diagonal, one, two, three, four, five, that's the power on the exponent. This was, these were the coefficients for a plus b to the first power. Here we have the coefficients for a plus b squared, a plus b cubed, a plus b to the fourth, and now here's the fifth power. Uh, you notice there are six numbers written across there, and we said that if you expand a plus b to a power, you get one more term, you get one more term, then you get the power. So a fifth power, I should get six terms. Okay, now I'm gonna write those numbers down, a, uh, one, five, 10, 10, five, one, and expand a plus b to the, to the fifth. In fact, maybe there's enough room right below this problem uh, to write this out. So I think you'll probably have to remove the, the box over on the lower right for us to squeeze this in. But a plus, oops, a plus b to the fifth power is going to be, first of all, 1, a to the fifth. The next term is going to be a to the fourth b. And what's the coefficient? Five. A five, OK? And the next term is going to be a cubed b squared. You notice the a's are going down, the b's are going up. The coefficient is? 10. 10. Mm -hmm. And the next term will be 10 a squared b cubed. And the next term would be 5a b to the fourth. And then the last term is b to the fifth. So by writing out Pascal's triangle, I have the coefficients 
for the expansion of the binomial, and that's really the only subtle part, because everything else is pretty straightforward. The A's go down, the B's go up, every term has degree five, degree five here, degree five here, degree five here, etc., all the way across. Okay, uh, looking at Pascal's triangle, there are some other interesting patterns that we can find in the triangle. Um, you notice coming down here we have ones on the, these two diagonals. Uh, what about this diagonal, what did we say? Consecutive integers. They're just consecutive integers and they happen to be the exponents of the a plus b that's being expanded. What about the numbers we see here, one, three, and six? One, three, and six. Have you ever seen numbers like that before? The next number was going to be 10 coming down that way. Also, 1, 3, 6, 10 coming down this way. These numbers are called triangular numbers. Let me just show you up above. Here's why they're called triangular. 1, I could represent with one dot. 3, I could represent with three dots. 6, I could represent with six dots like this. In other words, I could make triangles out of them. Could I represent 10 as a triangle? Sure, I'd start with four dots. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, one. In what uh, sport, shall we say, do you see an arrangement like that? Pool? Uh, yeah, pool, except pool has 15 balls. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, just regular, what they call straight pool. 15 balls, so when you rack the balls, it's one through five, and there are 15 balls. But where do you see these 10? Well, this is something I used to do a lot when I was in high school. Let's go bowling. So uh, 10 dots, if you, rep you see the arrangement of the, of the bowling pins that way. Okay, so uh, those are called triangular numbers. And along the diagonals, we see those triangular numbers. Uh, another pattern is look at the sum along every <coughs> row. Well, the sum on this row is one. The sum on this row is two. The sum on this row is uh, four. What's the sum on this row? Eight. Eight, okay. And uh, the sum on, let's see, I'll go to the very end. What's the sum on, on, on I'm going to call this row four because there's a four there. What's the sum on row four? Sixteen. Sixteen. Let's see, we have one, two, four, eight, sixteen. What <coughs> pattern do you see there? Uh, powers of two. Those are powers of two, yeah. And I've erased uh, row five, but those would add up to be 32. So in other words, we could, uh, we could hazard a guess that if you expand an expression like a plus b to the uh, nth power, that the sum of the coefficients in a plus b to the nth power is 2 to the nth. You see, this is uh, 2 to the fourth, and this is 2 to the third, this is 2 to the second, and this is 2 to the first, and this one is 2 to the zero right here. So imagine there's a zero right there. Um, so if you're expanding a plus b to the nth, then all the coefficients should add up to be 2 raised to that power. Uh, so yet another pattern that we find in Pascal's triangle. And there, there are still other patterns in it, um, but we don't need to, need to get into all that. Okay, well rather than just talk about it, let's actually use it. So let's go to the next graphic and see how we could use Pascal's triangle to expand a few terms. Uh, I'm going to work these out on the green board, but uh, the first problem says expand a plus b to the fifth. You know, I think we've actually done that one already, so I think I'll skip that, a plus b to the fifth. But then we want to uh, find x plus 3 to the sixth, 5y minus 1 to the fourth, and now here's a complicated one, u cubed minus 10v squared cubed. Now I say it's complicated, but actually it's no more complicated than any of these others, and they're all fairly easy to work out. So I'm going to go to the green screen and work these individually, except for that one, because we've already done a plus b to the fifth. And let's see how we would expand every one of these using Pascal's triangle. Um, OK, so if we come to the green board, I'm going to write up here in the corner uh, the numbers that I see in Pascal's triangle. One, two, one was that row. Uh, what was the next row? Could you tell me what that was? One, three, three, one. One, three, three, one. Yeah, and the next row was. Um, one, four, six, four, one. One, four, six, four, one. Yeah, and then I think that's as far as we had printed on the graphic, but then we found one more row a little bit earlier. And of course, this just, this just keeps on going over here. Now, the first problem that we had was to find 
uh, x plus 3 to the 6th power. So let's do that right here. x plus 3 to the 6th power. Um, so do I have enough rows in my triangle to work this problem? Not quite yet. I don't think so, because I need to get to row number 6. That's the one in the, if you look at the second diagonal, I get to, you need to go to row 6 to go with that 6. Now that means I'm starting, I'm calling this one row 0 up here and then row 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's fill in row 6. Um, who wants to tell us what row 6 will be? Susan, could you tell us what row 6 is? 1, okay. 6, mm -hmm. 15, right. 20, mm -hmm. 15, 15, 6. 6, and 1. one. Right. You know, one of, the, one, one of the patterns that we have in Pascal's triangle, I, I should have mentioned, it's fairly obvious, is that the triangle is perfectly symmetrical. So as you go from the middle out, 15, 6, 1, and here 15, 6, 1. So if you go right down the middle, if you, if you could draw a line right down the middle, uh, of course it would split it on the row 5, then it's perfectly symmetrical. So if you know the first half, you also know the second half of the, of the triangle. Okay, now when I expand this, I'm going to get, well, I'm going to treat x as if it were a, and I'm going to treat 3 as if it were b. So this would be, um, actually maybe I better go down here to make sure I have plenty of room. This would be 1x to the 6th plus 6x to the 5th times 3 to the 1st. See, that's my a, b term, a to the 5th, b to the 1st. And then I'll have 15x to the 4th times what? 9. Oh, 9. Okay, I'm going to write it as 3 squared just so we see that that's a, a sixth degree term where I'm thinking of this as my, my b. And then I'll have uh, 20, 20 x to the third times 3 cubed. And then I'll have 15 x squared times 3 to the fourth. And then I'll have 6 x times 3 to the fifth plus I'll have to squeeze this one in underneath, plus 1 times 3 to the 6. Now you might say, Dennis, this is terribly long and complicated. Well, what's the alternative to writing it out this way? What's the alternative to finding x plus 3 to the 6? Multiply it out. Multiply it out. Yeah, you'd have to write this down, x plus 3 times x plus 3 times x plus 3, and you see what's going to happen here, and multiply it out. Multiply that out by regular multiplication. Now that's what takes a long time. This is, this is fairly simple child's play. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, if I go back and simplify this, I have x to the sixth plus uh, 18 x to the fifth plus uh, 9 times 15. What, what's 10 times 15? 150. Okay, so what's 9 times 15? 135. Yeah, it'd be, just be 15 less. That's going to be 135 x to the fourth plus 20 times, um, what's 3 cubed? 27. Yeah, 20 times 27. It's going to end in a zero. What's 2 times 27? 54. 54. That'll be 540 x cubed. Okay, so we're doing pretty good here. Uh, now, 3 to the fourth is 81. 81 times 15. Oh, 81 times 15. Let's see if we can do that without a calculator here. Um, if I want to find 81 times 15, I'll tell you what, what is 80 times 15? 80 15s. Well, wouldn't that be the same thing as 30 times 40? Yeah, what I did is I doubled that number and I cut this one in half. 30 times 40 is 1,200. So this is 1,200. Okay, but that's 80 15s. What's 81 15s? Uh, 1215. 1215, yeah. Is, isn't that the year the Magna Carta was signed, I think? Okay, 1215. Uh, <laughs> just had to see if you were paying attention there. Okay, 1215 uh, x squared plus, now, um, let's see, 81, that was 3 to the fourth. What's 3 to the fifth? Well, I have to put another 3 in there. To 243. 243. 243 times 6. You know, I think, uh, I think I've reached the point where I'm going to have to go to regular multiplication. 243 times 6 is 8, 5, 
2, 6. Did I do that right? I think I did. So uh, 2, 6, 5, 8 times x plus, OK, now we come to 3 to the 6th. Oh my gosh, 3 to the 6th. What's 3 times this number? That's 3 to the 5th. I think it's 729 plus uh, 729 right here. OK, so this is the expansion of x plus 3 to the 6th power. Did you see a mistake? Yeah, 243 times 6 is 1,458. Oh. oh, yeah, of course, yes. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm better off using my shortcuts than I'm regular multiplication. Yeah, that's going to be 18 carry 1, 25. This is 12, so not 24. So that's going to be uh, 1458. What happened in 1428? Can it, 1458, can anyone sell, tell us? Good, I can't either. Okay, uh, 1458 and 729. Okay, so I think now we have the coefficients right. You know, what was the hardest part of this problem? It was the multiplication. That's where I made a mistake. The actual expansion is pretty, is pretty simple, actually, if you know Pascal's triangle. Now, you might say, Dennis, when was the last time I ever had to expand a binomial to the sixth power? You may be asking yourself that. When are you going to have to expand x plus 3 to the sixth power or something comparable to it? Uh, well, you know, you, you just never know. But I think what's, what's important is that you become familiar with the patterns in the triangle because these things uh, come up, um, well, in other courses now and then, and you'll hear references to Pascal's triangle. Let's go back to that graphic that had the examples on it, and let's pick another problem from those examples to work. Yeah, we've just done part B. <coughs> uh, let's go to part C, 5y minus 1 to the fourth. Now, here are some of the differences that we see in this problem. Uh, it's a difference rather than a sum. And the first term is not a simple a or x, but it's a 5y. But we do have a rather simple second term, raised to the fourth power. OK, so here we go. Uh, let's try working out. If you go back to the green board, let's try, oops. You know what, I just erased Pascal's triangle. Let me just fill it in right here. Somebody help me out. What's the next row? 1, 2, 1. 1, 2, 1. Thanks a lot. What's the next row? 1, 3, 3, 1. 1, 3, 3, 1. The next row? 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. Oh, that's cheating. He's reading it right off his paper. I kept okay. mine. Uh, Lene, what's the next row going to be? 1, 5, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 5, five one. 1. Very good. OK, and we could keep on going as far as necessary, but I think this is enough. We wanted to find 5y minus 1 to the uh, fourth power. Yeah. Well, let's see. How, how are we going to handle that negative? I think we could write this as a sum if I write it this way. 5y plus what? Negative 1. Plus a negative 1, OK? So what I'm going to do is just treat a as if it were 5y, and I'm going to choose b as if it were negative 1, and let's expand it. The very first term is going to be 1 times 5y raised to the fourth power. Now, that's everything there, both the 5 and the y are raised to the fourth power. Plus, what's the next coefficient going to be? Let's see. Times yeah. 5y to the third. Right. Times negative 1. Exactly. Very good. You see, we're using this row because this is the fourth power, the 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So that's where we get the 4 from right here. 5y cubed, negative 1 to the first. Then the next term will be 6 times 5y squared times negative 1 squared. And then the next term will be what? Anybody? Somebody other than Stephen, he's, he answered several of these others. What's the next term going to be? What's the coefficient? Four. Four, Four yeah. What else, Susan? Uh, 5y. 5y. Times negative 1 to the third. Times negative 1 to the third. And I see I, I keep crowding myself in on the last term. And the last term is going to be plus 1 times negative 1 to the fourth. OK, so what I do is I, I write out this, this, these terms in factored form. Then I go back and reduce them. And uh, let's see, 5 to the 4th, that would be 25 squared. Does anybody know what 25 squared is? Is it 625? Uh, he's asking me, is it 625? It is, it is 625. You know, the way I do that is I think if I had 25 quarters, I know I'm weird, if I had 25 quarters, 
how much money would I have? Well, let's see, that'd be $6.25. Yeah, that's it. Okay, now the next term, well, there's a negative over here. Let's bring that up to the front. 5 cubed, that's 125 times 4. That's 500. 500 y cubed. Will the next term be positive or negative? Positive. Positive, because the negative one is squared. And this is 25 times 6. Well, if you had 6 quarters. You have a dollar 50. You'd have a dollar 50. I wish. Okay, so that would be 150 y squared. The next term will be negative. Okay, are you sitting down? Good. Uh, what's 5 times 4? Your bet is 20. 20 times y. And then plus 1. Well, let's see. Does anybody see a shortcut? that would explain what happens when you have a difference rather than a sum in this answer. Alternating signs. The signs alternate. So rather than putting in a negative one and a negative one and a negative one, what you could do is expand this using 5y and plus one. If you just remember to alternate the signs, you start off with a plus, and in this case I happen to end up with a plus, but for other powers I could end up with a negative on the end. Just go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, and wherever, wherever the alternating signs lead you, so be it. So this is the expansion of 5y minus 1. Now, you know, those of you at home and those people in the class may say, well, now, Dennis, you know, we probably could have multiplied that out by hand faster than it took you to write all this down. But, you know, I've been trying to explain it as I go, and there have been several of us contributing information here. Plus, I've been adding all the fancy jokes along the way. You can't forget that. So uh, that's why it took me a little longer than usual to work this out. But I think with practice, Pascal's triangle gives you a real advantage, especially if you have a power bigger than four. A fourth power doesn't, isn't really that complicated to compute. But what if it had been a 14th power or a 40th power? You merely have to write Pascal's triangle out to the appropriate row. And then you have to have a wide enough sheet of paper or enough lines to record all those terms on. But it only takes one line to write it out in factored form and the second line then to write it out in its simplified, simplified form. Okay, let's go back to the example screen and I'll try to remember to save Pascal's triangle here. Now, see, in the last example, what makes it uh, more complicated is not so much the power, it's only a third power, but inside I've got a u cubed minus 10v squared. Let's try working that one out here on the green screen. We have uh, u cubed minus 10v squared, and this is raised to the third power. Okay, well, the first thing I would say is there are going to be how many terms in this answer? Four. Four terms, yeah, because this is a third power. So let's make room for four terms. Okay, now the next thing is there's a negative in here, so what can you tell me about the signs? They're going to alternate, so let's go back and make a negative here and make a negative over here. Okay, now I'm going to be uh, taking these terms to be A and B, so I'll begin with my first term cubed. And By the way, I'm using this row right here, so I'll have 1 times u cubed cubed, and then I'll have a 3 times u cubed squared times 10 v squared and then I'll have another 3 and a u cubed to the first power and a 10 v squared squared. Let's move that negative over a little bit. And the last term will be 10 v squared cubed. Okay, so I have my terms written out. That's the first, that, that's my, the, my, my first stage. And then finally, I go back and reduce these. What's u cubed cubed? Is it u to the 27th? u to the 9th. It's u to the 9th, thank you. Yeah, u to the 27th is a common wrong answer. Uh, minus, now here I have a 3 and a 10. That makes a 30. U to the, uh, uh, rather, u to the 6th and v squared plus, what will be the next coefficient? 30. Uh, not 30. Oh. 300. 300. Yes, because we have a 10 squared times 3. That'll be a plus 300 u cubed v to the fourth. v squared squared. And then minus 1,000 v to the sixth. So this is the expansion of this binomial. And I think that most people would find this approach uh, quicker, especially for larger powers. 
then that is using Pascal's triangle, then to do straight multiplication for these sorts of problems. Okay, well, now we know how to use Pascal's triangle, but there's, there's some more subtleties to it that we haven't investigated yet. Let's go to the next graphic and we'll introduce factorials. Now, we'll be using factorials in the rest of this episode and in the next two episodes when we talk about permutations and combinations and probability. But right now, I'm just introducing uh, some, some terms. Now, if you take the product of the first n positive integers, that's denoted by n factorial, and uh, we put an exclamation mark after the n. So this does not mean n. No, it means n factorial. So n factorial means 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 up to n. Let me just use this space right here to take an example. Suppose I had 4 factorial. Well, then that would mean 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, which is how much? 24. Yeah, it looks like that's uh, 6 times 4 is 24 times 24. On the other hand, what if I wanted to change this to 5 factorial? What would I do differently? Times by a 5. Have to put a 5 in there, yeah. Okay, now how much is this? Well, let's see, here's a 12, and here's a 10. 12 and 10, the 1's not going to affect the answer. That's 120. So we've gone from 24 to 120. If you were to go to 6 factorial, that would be 720. And if you go to 8 factorial, you're into the thousands. And so fact th these factorials grow very rapidly. And uh, many of you have a factorial key on your calculator. You may have, if you look at your calculator, you may have a key that looks like this. It may say X factorial with a little exclamation mark by it. And if you enter a 5, <clears throat> and then you push that key, immediately you should see 120. Now, if this isn't written on a key, it may be written above a key on your calculator, or it may be written on, under a menu, like if you have a TI-82 or a TI-89, you may see X factorial written under a menu that you could call up. And if you put, press that button, it will immediately multiply, in this case, 1 through 5, and give you 120. <clears throat> Now you might say, well, why would my calculator have a factorial key on it? I've never used a factorial before. Well, maybe not so far, but in later courses, factorials are used uh, sometimes, quite a bit. And in fact, in the rest of this course, we're going to be using factorials. So if you have this key available, you might keep it in mind. Okay, now, just to complete this, uh, this graphic, there's one special case, and that's zero factorial, or zero with an exclamation mark. Uh, and this is defined to be 1, so we say that 0 factorial is equal to 1. Now, what's wrong with the definition right here? Why couldn't I just write 0 factorial using this definition? Because it doesn't start at 0. It doesn't start at 0. It starts at 1 and it goes up. So if you put a 0 in here, you can't start at 1 and go up to 0. So you see, this technically doesn't make any sense. But we define 0 factorial to be 1. Uh, so that it will fit with some of, the, uh, some of the formulas and definitions that we see later. So we'll just take this to be one. That's just the definition of it. Okay, uh, now with this introduction to factorials, let's go to the next graphic and uh, look at what are called binomial coefficients. Uh, for each pair of integers, n and r, where r is somewhere between 0 and n, so we're talking about integers. These would have to necessarily be non-negative integers because they're both at least 0, and r is less than or equal to n. Then we will be writing some expressions where I put parentheses and I stack two numbers in here, n and r. So if n is larger, I'll be putting the n on top. And the way we define this expression is we take the upper number factorial and I divide it by r factorial times the difference factorial. Now you might say, why in the world would you want to introduce something like this? Well, it's going to become quite useful here in the rest of this episode. It may not be something you've seen before, but it's something that you will be seeing now. Okay, if I use that definition, let's go to the green screen and calculate a few values that look like this. Suppose I had 4, 2. 4, 2. Uh, I'd like to evaluate this expression. This is sometimes referred to as a binomial coefficient, which we'll explain in a moment why it has that name. Now, according to the definition, I'm going to put 4 factorial over 2 factorial 
times the difference factorial, 4 minus 2 factorial. That'll be 4 factorial <coughs> over 2 factorial times 2 factorial again. Now, to evaluate this, what I would do is to cancel off um, two of the factorials. You see, in the numerator, I have 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. In the denominator, I have 1 times 2, and I have another 1 times 2. So I'm going to cancel off two, two portions of the factorials, this and this. And so what I'm left with is 3 times 4 over 2 which is 6. So this expression has a value of 6. And I'm using the formula, I probably should have written this again at the beginning, I'm using the formula n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. Okay, I think we should do one more, one more like this. What if we had, um, oh, let's see, what if we had 10, 7, 10, 7. Well, let's see, this would be 10 factorial over what? 7 factorial. 7 factorial. Times 3 factorial. Times the difference factorial, 3 factorial. Okay, now, you know, on top I have how many factors? How many factors are there in 10 factorial? 10. 10 factors. Why don't I cancel 7 of those factors with 7 factorial? Because there is a 7 factorial within the 10 factorial. And if I cancel off 1 through 7, what would be left on top? 10 times, or 8 times 10. Yeah, times or 10. 10 times 9 times 8, I think Jeff was going to say, or 8 times 9 times 10. So I've canceled off the 7 through 1, and I've canceled off down here, 7 down to 1, and I'm left with 3 factorial on the bottom. So, you know, 3 factorial, if I were to write that out, would be 1 times 2 times 3. And the 2, I can cancel with the 8 and leave a 4. And the 3, I can cancel with the 9 and leave a 3. And so this answer is how much? 120. 120. Yeah. Um, now, you know, just above it here, let me just erase this upper portion and ask you a very similar question. Suppose I wanted to calculate this value, 10, but instead of 7, I'm going to put the difference in there, 3. Uh, 10 minus 7 is 3. What if I put in a 3 instead of a 7 there? So I'm replacing 7 with its, uh, shall we say, with its complement. This will be 10 factorial over 3 factorial times what? 7 factorial. Times 7 factorial, because now 7 becomes the difference. Well, if you compare these two, these are exactly the same expressions. And therefore, this should also equal 120. So I think what we're demonstrating is a fact about factorials that I can summarize in this way. And that is that if I have n r, if I have the binomial coefficient n r, this is the same thing as n and put the complement of r on the bottom, n minus r. In other words, if I subtract 7 from n, uh, uh, rather, r from n, I get n minus r. These numbers are the same thing. Let's write these out and see why. n r is n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. That was the definition. <coughs> and the other expression, n, n minus r, is n factorial over n minus r factorial, that's the number that I have on bottom, times the difference. Now the difference is n minus n minus r factorial. So here I take my lower number, n minus r factorial, and I take the difference. But you know, if I reduce this, that's just going to be an r factorial. n factorial, n minus r factorial, and uh, r factorial. Now if you compare this answer with that answer, those are the same. So we have this fact right here that says that n r is the same as n n minus r. Uh, we're going to see how this, uh, how this comes up in just a moment. In fact, let's look at it right now. Let's go to the next graphic on the binomial theorem. 
Okay, now this is a theorem that was, uh, that was first proved by Isaac Newton in a more general form. And it says that if you want to expand a plus b to the uh, nth power, then you're going to get an a to the n, you're going to get an a to the n minus 1b, you're going to get an a to the n minus 2b squared. You notice here my powers on a going down. The powers on a go down by 1. The powers on b are going up. There aren't any b's. b to the first, b squared, all the way up to, finally, b to the n, and the a's are gone. Every term here has degree n. I have n variables there. I have n variables here n variables here, all the way down. But now my coefficients are, do not come directly from Pascal's triangle. These are the binomial coefficients that we just introduced. In my first term, I have zero b's, and so I call this n zero. In my next term, I have one b, and I call this n one. In the next term, I have two b's, and the binomial coefficient is n two. And so it goes, when I get to the n minus, when, when I get to the term that has n minus 1 b's, it's n, n minus 1. And when there are n b's, I have the term n, n. Okay, so if I calculate each one of those binomial coefficients, that will tell me the number that came out of Pascal's triangle. If we come to the green screen, let's just write out something like this um, using binomial coefficients. Suppose I had a plus b cubed. Now, we already know what the answer to that is. We've seen it come up today. But I'm going to write this as 3, 0, because n is 3, a cubed, plus 3, 1, a squared b. What would be the next coefficient? 3, 2. 3, 2. And what would be the variables? a, b squared. a, b squared. And finally, 3, 3 b cubed. Now, you know, this number and this number should be the same because what I've done is I've replaced 1 with its complement 2. That's the complement in 3. So I've replaced 1 with a 2. Those numbers should be alike. These numbers should be alike because I've replaced 0 with its complement in 3. That would be a 3. Okay, now, how much are each one of these numbers? I think I only need to count calculate that one and that one, and then these two will be the same as the two that I've just calculated. So how much is 3, 0? Well, that's 3 factorial over 0 factorial times the difference factorial, 3 minus 0 factorial. That's 3 factorial over 0 factorial times 3 factorial. Well, these two cancel off. And how much did we say 0 factorial is defined to be? We call it a 1. Yeah, just so that it, at moments like this, we can evaluate it, and I get 1 over 1 or 1. So the first coefficient is a 1. Now, what's the coefficient here? Uh, what would you guess this should be when you, when you cube a plus b? What should be the second coefficient? I think it should be a 3. I think that's what Pascal Strangle told us. So this, if I calculate 3, 1, that'll be 3 factorial over 1 factorial times the difference factorial, that's 2 factorial. Now to reduce this, let's cancel off the 2 factorial. And what will be left on top? 3. There's a 3. Yeah, we're canceling off the 1 and the 2, and the 1 and the 2. There's a 3 left on top over 1 factorial, which is 3 over 1, which is 3. So what I can conclude from this is that a plus b to the third power should be 1a cubed, so I'll write a cubed, plus 3a squared b. And then because of symmetry, this coefficient should be the same as that one because I have the complement as my lower number. So that'll be 3ab squared. And then th this binomial coefficient should be the same as the first one because I've replaced 0 with its complement. That'll be 1 be cubed. And that's exactly what Pascal's triangle gives me. We've, we've seen this answer before. Now you might say, well, Dennis, uh, what is the point of this? If we can use Pascal's triangle to expand a binomial, why would I want to calculate the coefficients in this way? Well, you know, what if I weren't wanting to compute a plus b to the third power? What if I were wanted to compute a plus b to the 30th power? Then I would have 31 terms. 
And when I write down Pascal's triangle, including the zero row, I'd have to write 31 rows all the way down. An alternative would be to calculate individual coefficients in this manner. We won't do a plus b to the 30th power, but this gives me a way of picking out individual coefficients and computing them directly without having to write out all of Pascal's, all of Pascal's triangle. Okay, um, let me just take another example like this and let's see how computing binomial coefficients can help me evaluate a problem. Suppose we had, um, let's say, 10 c minus 2 to the fifth power. 10 c minus 2 to the fifth power. Can anyone tell me how many terms this is going to have in its expansion? Six. It'll have six terms. It has one more term than the fifth power because I have to have a c to the fifth, a c to the fourth, third, squared, first power, and then the zero power. So there are actually six terms to write down. Now the first term will be um, 5, 0 times 10 c to the fifth power. The, and now the signs are going to alternate because of the negatives. So I'll put a negative here. 5, 1. 10 c to the fourth power times 2. And then I'll put a plus. And then 5, 2, 10 c to the third power times 2 squared minus. Okay, I'll just bring that minus down to the next row. Minus 5, 3 times 10 c squared times 2 cubed. You notice the degree is always going to be a total of five, five factors there. Plus 5, 4, 10 c to the first power times 2 to the fourth. Minus 5, 5 uh, times 2 to the fifth because my 10 c's now drop out. Okay, now let's see. These two coefficients will be the same. These two coefficients will be the same. And these two coefficients will be the same. I'm using that symmetry property. These are alike, these are alike, and now I'll do a little crisscross. These are alike. So I really only need to calculate three coefficients, not five. Let's calculate five, zero. I bet you know what that's going to be. Five, zero, that's five factorial over zero factorial times five factorial. This, this being the difference right here, and I get a one. Yeah, so that lead term should have a one on it. And then 5, 1 is 5 factorial over 1 factorial times the difference factorial. And if I cancel off 4 factorial, I have a 5 left on top. 5 over 1 is 5. And then if I go to the coefficient here, 5, 2, I'll have 5 factorial over 2 factorial times the difference, 3 factorial. What would you cancel off here to make this, to make this uh, uh, simpler to compute? Wh what would be better, to cancel the 2 factorial or the 3 factorial? The 3 factorial. Yeah, let's cancel as many as we can. Let's cancel 3 factorial, and that leaves me with 4 times 5. But I still have the 2 factorial, 1 times 2. That's 20 over 2 is 10. So that tells me the first coefficient here is a 1. The second coefficient is a 5. The next coefficient is a 10. But now, what's this coefficient? 10. That's a 10 because, see, I'm using the complement of the 2 that came just before it. That's a 10. This is a 5 because it agrees with that one. And this one is a 1. OK, I have all my coefficients. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, now I'm going to uh, expand this and write down my final answer. Let's see, 10 c to the fifth power. What's 10 to the fifth? 100,000. 100,000, yeah, it's a one with five zeros. 100,000 c to the fifth, minus. Uh, now next I have uh, 10 to the fourth. That's gonna be, what's 10 to the fourth? 10,000. 10,000, 10, but I have another 10, a five times two. So that makes 100,000 again, c to the fourth, plus. 
And now I have 10 to the third, let's see, 10 to the third, that's 1,000, times 10 is 10,000, times 4 is 40,000, that's 40,000 c cubed minus. Okay, now, the next term. This is going to be 100, because there's a 10 squared there, times 10 to 1,000, times 8 is 8,000 c squared plus. Let's go down to the next line. 10 times 5. I tell you what, let's take one of the 2's and that 5. One of these 2's and that 5's makes a 10. There's another 10, that's 100, and I have three 2's left over. That's 100 times 8, 800. C. Minus, now all my 10's are gone. 2 to the 5th is 32. So this is 10C minus 2 to the 5th power. It's this six-term polynomial. Now, you might say, well, you know, Pascal's triangle might have made this a little bit quicker, but I do have an alternate way now of picking out individual terms and calculating them. Um, and uh, so this, this, this gives me now a, a second way to compute these binomials. Okay, let's go to the last graphic. Um, here I ask you a few questions about the expansion of a binomial. And uh, I think we've been answering questions sort of like this, but here we see it in a, in a concrete form. How many terms are there in the expansion of a plus b to the 12th power? 13. There would be 13 terms. Yeah, 13 terms. Because uh, it's a 12th power, and we get an extra power to include uh, an extra term because there's a zero power involved. Uh, what's going to be the very first term of that expansion? Uh, Jeff, what would you say? A to the 12th. A to the 12th. Yeah, it would be 1 times A to the 12th. <coughs> and what's going to be the 13th term? B to the 12th. B to the 12th. Yes, that's going to be down at the far right end, B to the 12th. Now, what's the fifth term going to be? Well, let's see. Now, the fifth term is going to be, um, we started off with A to the 12th, and we're going to reduce it four times, so we'll have A to the what? A to the 8th, I think. And the b's, which started on 0, are going to come up to b to the 4th. So it would be a to the 8th, b to the 4th. Now what we need is a coefficient. Let's come to the green screen and try calculating the fifth term. So let's write down that question. We're wondering, what is the fifth term of a plus b to the 12th power? Well, let's see. We have a term, and we have a term, and we have a term, and we have a term. Here's the fifth term. That's the one we want. Now, what we found out was the very first term is a to the 12th. And we found out that the very last term down here is b to the 12th. But the question is, what is the fifth term right there? Well, that term is going to have to have an a to the 8th and a b to the 4th. Now, the way I figured that is we started on 12, and we got 11, 10, 9, 8, a to the 8th. And the b's are going up. b to the 0, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, b to the 4th. And the coefficient we'll have what two numbers in the binomial coefficient? 12 and... Yeah, what number are we going to put there? 4. 12 and 4, very good, because you see the very first coefficient is 12, 0. So here's 12, 0, 12, 1, 12, 2, 12, 3, 12, 4. So you can't go by the fifth term and put a 5 here. You go by, well, what I go by is the power on the b. So b 12, 4. So how much is 12, 4? Well, let's just write it out. That's 12 factorial over 4 factorial times 8 factorial, a to the 8th, b to the 4th. Uh, now, if you were going to cancel here, which, which of the denominator factors would you cancel? 8 factorial. 8 factorial. Get rid of as many as you can. So that's going to leave us with 9, 10, 11, and 12 on top, because we canceled 1 through 8. On the bottom, I have 1, 2, 3, and 4. Well, let's see. 3 and 4 is 12, so that gets rid of that guy. Rather than dividing by 2, let's go ahead and multiply this out and divide by 2 afterwards. I'm thinking this is 99 times 10 is 990 over... Oh, you know what? I left off my variables. Let me just put my variables on the end of that. a to the 8th, b to the 4th. Now. When I multiply that out, I get 990 over 2, a to the 8th, b to the 4th. 
And now let's divide by two, so I don't have to do any further multiplication. That'll be 495 a to the eighth, b to the fourth. That is the fifth term. That's what goes right here. That's going to be 495 a to the eighth, b to the fourth. Have to squeeze that in, in that, in that position. Okay, one more example. <clears throat> And I'll do this one on the green screen. I'm wondering how much is 11 raised to the sixth power? 11 raised to the sixth power. No, I tell you what, let me make that a little bit smaller. That may be a little, little bit uh, too aggressive there. Let's go to the fourth power, and then we'll do the sixth power after, that, after this. Now, in this case, I'm going to go back and use Pascal's triangle one more time to illustrate, just to remind people how this goes. And I'm going to raise this number to the fourth power using Pascal's triangle. The way I'll do it is I'll think of this as being 10 plus 1 to the fourth power. So this is my a plus b. So when I expand this, I get 10 to the fourth plus 4 times 10 to the third times 1 plus 6, whoops, better put a multiplication dot in there, plus 6 times 10 squared times 1 squared, I won't bother writing that one out, 1 squared is just 1, plus 4 times 10, plus 1. Now, you notice this is in an abbreviated form. I didn't show my B factors because those are all 1s. And so this is going to give me 10,000 plus 4,000 plus 600 plus 40 plus 1. Now, if you add that all up, that's going to be 10,000, 4,000, 641. Where have you seen these numbers before? Pascal's triangle. That is Pascal's triangle. You see, that row of the triangle represents 11 raised to that power. What would you guess would be 11 cubed? 1,331. 1,331. Here's 11 squared. Look, here's 11. And here's 11 to the zero power. Well, it was nice seeing you today, and I'll see you next time for permutations and combinations in episode 37.